Hi. Are you going? Okay. Well, my name is Joshua Murphy. I will be guiding you through the wonderful, wonderful world of Japanese game shows and their effect on the American marketplace. We may have to hurry because we had a little bit of time lag, so we may be skipping some stuff. But we will hit on all the important points. So if you want to go ahead and start that slideshow. Alrighty, we're going to be primarily focusing on, may as well hold it, uh, Japanese game shows that have at some point or another come to the United States. Uh, there'll be revisionist history, I'm sure, but we're going to try our best. Okay, go ahead and click. So uh, before we really delve deep into it, I wanted to get a start with the early television in Japan. Uh, after World War II, Japan took some time to rebuild itself. Television took a back burner. Um, so the first commercial television didn't come around until 1953. Now, the country didn't have a whole lot of original ideas for shows, so they were borrowing a lot of formats from the Western world. Uh, the very first show to air as a game show in Japan was a show called Watashi no Shikota wa Nanda Show. Does anyone know what that means in English? Minasan wa wakare ka? Good. Uh, what is my job? Watashi no Shikota wa Nanda Show. What is my job? What is my occupation? What is my line? It was a remake of the American show What's my line? And it was a big success lasting exactly only one year. <laughs> the first show that most people will cite as the very first Japanese game show is a thing called Gesture. Does anyone here own a VCR? Talk to me after the show. <laughs> Which was uh, Charades. Now, it was actually, despite what's written online, based on an American format called Mike Stokey's Pantomime Quiz. Uh, you know, they would put up a humorous phrase, and the celebrity would try to, using Charades, act it out to the contestant in order so that they could guess what it was. Uh, and then also you had these very erudite quiz programs, which are just people sitting behind lecterns and answering questions. Uh, they were all pretty much the same thing, which just with different window dressing. So you weren't seeing a lot of original content. You were seeing maybe some visual ideas that were unique to the country, but not in terms of actual formatting, in terms of shows. They were mostly borrowing from America and France. The very first. Japanese television game show to make any sort of impact in the Western market is a show called Trans America Ultra Quiz, America Udon Ultra Quiz. And what American Udon Ultra Quiz was, was it was a, it was more of a travelogue show than it was a game show, but what it was, it was a yearly special that was part of the Thursday night uh, special that they would do on Nippon TV. And I will try to, my best to be as animated as I possibly can. Um, we are at the Help me out. Korekuen Stadium. Any native speakers want to call me on the correct pronunciation of that? Thank you. Later it was at the Tokyo Dome. I like that pronunciation much better. So big, big, huge, a massive amount of trivia fans, trivia hopefuls, all arrive at the stadium, all hoping to become that year's quiz king. Norio Fukutome invites them all in, gives some sort of big opening grandiose speech, yada, yada, and points out to the fact that there is a huge section marked with a giant X and another huge section marked with a giant circle. So he will then say, if you think the answer is true, go to the section marked with the giant circle. If you think the answer is false, go to the section marked with the giant X. You have 30 seconds. And the question is usually something to the effect of, um, true or false, in 1972, President Nixon made the Statue of Liberty an honorary US citizen. Yeah, if you said false, you're right, and you've ruined my bit. No inanimate object has ever been granted honorary United States citizenship. So those who, uh, everybody in this room, would move on to the next question. And we would keep doing that over and over and over and over and over again until we got down to about 100 people. Those 100 people would be told, pack your bags, say goodbye to your family, and meet us at Tokyo International Airport on such and such date. However, there are 100 of you, and we only have 50 airplane tickets. So how do we determine who gets a ticket and who doesn't? Well, through the classic, we have 100 people. Naturally, we go one-on-one, -on -one, mono a mono, in the most Japanese of all games, John Ken Pon, rock, paper, scissors. First to three matches, wins the ticket. The other 50 go home, unless a second chance is offered to them. Now, the 50 then get on a plane bound for Guam, but tis no pleasure flight this be. Whilst on, they must take a 400 question, three answer each test before the flight lands in Guam. Once the plane lands in Guam, the scores are tallied, and those who score the best win the luxury of getting off the plane. <laughs> Everybody else gets to say that they were this close to setting foot on Guam. 
You'll see in a minute. Uh, we then have another trivia challenge with the remaining 40. We have, we're on a beach in Guam. We have a giant wall with two polystyrene doors, one marked with a giant circle and one marked with a giant X. Contestants will start a great distance back, and then they will be asked another true or false question, one at a time, by the way. Uh, let me see if I can make the bit work now. Mm. True or false, the sun will never be directly over your head if you are in Japan. You are right. <laughs> it is also true here in America. Um, and you will run to the door, and if you break through the correct door, as all of you fine folks will, you will find yourself landing on a crash pad. However, if you uh, went for the bit that didn't end up happening and picked the wrong answer, break through the door, and you land face first in a huge pile of mud. We do that and do that until we get it down to about 20. Those 20 people then make their way to Hawaii. While in Hawaii, they play some other sort of trivia-themed game, usually, uh, usually a buzz-in answer type game. And then they will be asked to, you know, once they get the question correct, they will then have to do something secondary to that, like win a matching game or identify the correct husband to the correct wife in order to get the ticket to the next round. So we're going to keep, we're going to play that game until we get. 10 or 12, and those 10 or 12 will be in for the ride of a lifetime. Here's the map of our journey. I don't know how well that's going to show up. Let me put it on camera. At least that gets there. The winners are then flown to usually San Francisco or LA, somewhere on the West Coast, where they then compete in another trivia challenge, only akin much, much harder and much more unique to the area. For example, if we are in Nevada, uh, the first person to buzz in with their ultra hat. This is how they delineate who buzzed in first. This little thing would pop up, symbolizing who bugged in rather than a little light or something. Whoever buzzed in first, if you get the answer right, you have to run about, mm, I don't know, maybe 20 meters back, open a suitcase, and put on a sweater <laughs> in searing 100 degree heat. Then run back, sit back down, and try to get another question right so that you can run back and get put on a pair of pants. Don't worry, they weren't sunscreen. It's not that cruel. And again, we will do that until we have only one person remaining. They will be eliminated at that round until everybody has put on the correct amount of clothing to proceed to the next round. Along the way, we will go to city to city to city all across this fine country we call the United States, all the while showing various odd stereotypical things about the United States, Native Americans, Southern Bells in the South. Think of a stereotype of the 1980s. You can probably think of what you're going to see. Uh, Again, we lose one person each round, but you're not just given a ticket back to Tokyo. No, no, no. You have to compete in what is called a punishment game. What is a punishment game? Uh, well, it's usually native to the air. So for example, if we are in the Grand Canyon, what better way to explore it than by hiking through the Grand Canyon by yourself? Uh, if we are in, let's see, what other fun ones were there? If we're in Camp Pendleton, how about we have you run and join boot camp, including getting your head shaved? Head shaved. No, it's only if you're a guy. If, you women, you, if you're a woman, you just get the uh, standard bowl cut that they give to women in the military. <sighs> Bungee jumping, wrestling an alligator. Not a big alligator, one of the smaller alligators, but still, they don't know that. Again, designed to sort of scare, frighten, throw off the contestants. And again, each city, we go to a different stop across North America. You know, usually the United States, sometimes they go to Canada, sometimes they go to Mexico. In the ninth one, they went all over Europe. Again, we're going to keep doing this, keep doing this, losing people along the way. I want to point out this was 24 years before The Amazing Race premiered. <laughs> we find our way at the foot of the Statue of Liberty. Two competitors left. One will be declared the Ultra Quiz Grand Champion. The other will learn that they will become that close to being the champion, but having it taken away from them. Get a question right, you earn a point. Get a question wrong, you lose a point. First contestant to 10 points becomes quiz king for that year and is declared that year's ultra quiz grand champion. Now, what all does that mean? Well, here it would mean nothing. Because I already know the question that you want to ask. So I will answer it for you now. What is the grand prize, Joshua? What is this? What is worth all of this? What is worth leaving your friends and family behind, traveling to this strange country, going through all of this objectively crazy, bizarre, benign, embarrassing things on national television, taxing your brain to its mental limits? Do you want to know what the grand prize is? Publicity. Do you want to know what the grand prize is? Yes. I'm sorry I can't quite hear you. Do you want to know? 
Yeah. Then surely someone is one. Yeah. <laughs> Brand new log cabin. That is not a brand new log cabin. That is a brand new log cabin. We haven't even built the damn thing yet. <laughs> the winner will be flown to historic Vancouver, where they will win the honor of building their own log cabin. Once the log cabin is completed, they will have a big visual monument to honor the trivia challenge that they have had, coming all this way in a big, glorious prize for themselves. Of course, you win the cabin, but you do not win the land upon which the cabin is built, meaning that you're going to have to tear it down at some point. Oh. But you get to keep the lumber. That's something. Oh. <laughs> Japanese tax laws make it very difficult to give away more than 2 million yen, or roughly the equivalent of about 16,000 US dollars. So in order to circumvent this, you can give away prizes in excess of them at around that amount. So what the show would do is they would have these segments giving away something that was very, very valuable, but in terms of monetary cost, but would be ultimately useless, such as uh, an acre of Nevada desert, um, let's see here, a kit car that comes in pieces, an engineless airplane, cryonics membership, stakes in an Indian lottery that only an American citizen can collect on, uh, an island that is only seen during low tide. <laughs> You know, basically things that would have absolutely no use to anyone. So why would anyone go on this show? Why would anyone do this? Well, for three reasons. One, you get, to, you get free travel. Travel ain't cheap, believe me. Two, you get to become the quiz king. You get to know that you are the best of the best. Raise your hand if you have ever been Ultra Quiz Grand Champion. You will find that no one in this room has raised their hands, and you will find that no one watching has raised their hands either. Seventeen people can claim that. We can't claim that. They can run that over our heads for the rest of their lives. Three, you get to be on TV. Someone said it earlier, publicity. And sure enough, think about it. What, what do people do in this country to get on TV? A lot. Exactly. Get it free. <laughs> yep. And for what? The ability to be on TV. <sighs> so do we all want to see this fine show? Yes, absolutely. All righty. Uh, I've put together a music video set to some clips from the show. One of the great things about coming to the actual show here is you guys will get to see the actual footage, whereas the people watching online will not have that luxury because due to international copyright laws and stuff, I can't show it online. So we will fade down. You can either click it again. Off the side, click do another click off the side and you'll get it. There we go. Well, you weren't the only ones who thought that because in 1981, NBC decided to commission the very first, I'm going to double click, click it again. All-American Ultra Quiz, produced by American Bandstand host Dick Clark Productions in conjunction with 20th Century Fox. It was directed by Bill Carruthers, who would later go on to create and produce Press Your Luck, the version in the 80s, not the one that airs now. <sighs> and what contestants would do is they would have to, again, it was similar in nature, 920, 930-ish, there's an exact number I don't remember off the top of my head, would go to LA Dodger Stadium, do what I already told you, get questions right, get questions wrong, eliminated. And then from there, they would go to Louisiana, they would compete in a competition there. Louisiana, they would then go to Washington, D.C., compete in a quiz trivia steeplechase. Then the winners of that would move to jolly old England to compete in some sort of British-themed trivia challenge. Then they would go from England to Paris to compete in a trivia challenge. Then they would go to Greece. I can't do a Grecian accent because I don't know what that would be. To, again, compete in front of the Acropolis in some sort of trivia-themed challenge. And the winners there would be flown back to L.A. for the finale. Let's go for the click. Uh, Without, goes without saying, there are clearly uh, quite a few differences between the Japanese version and the American version. The Japanese version obviously ran for 16 series. The American only ran for once. Uh, the grand prize on Trans-American Ultra Quiz was something useless, like the aforementioned log cabin. Uh, Americans don't jive with that. They ain't going to do something unless they get paid. So the grand prize on this version was 100,000 US dollars, which was won by Craig Powers, uh, who as of the making of this, I believe, is still alive. Um, and whereas on Transamerica Ultra Quiz, losing contestants were forced to you know, ride buggies through mud, bungee jump, wrestle alligators. On uh, American Ultra Quiz, the challenges, the punishments were just sort of faux in nature, sleeping outside very utilitarian. Uh, Transamerica Ultra Quiz provides Japan with a view of America, again, through a lens of a stereotype. All American Ultra Quiz provides us with a 
lens of European life, which is weird when you remember the fact that the title of the show is All American <laughs> Ultra Quiz. That will come back later on in this presentation. So the very, very first attempt to bring a Japanese format to the United States ends in failure. The very first All-American Ultra Quiz becomes the very last All-American <laughs> Ultra Quiz. So Japanese formats sort of go away for a while. Uh, that is, again, we have a few more that eventually we will get to the next success, which is a little show called Waku Waku Dobutsurando, or Wild Wild Animal Land, or Exciting Animal Land. There's no official translation. And what Waku Waku Animal Land was, was, go ahead and click. It was a um, panel show format where they would have five celebrities sitting behind a panel. Uh, and the celebrities would then be shown some sort of footage of an edit package of animals that had been put together of elephants. They would send camera crews all over the world and to the Tokyo Zoo. Profiles on elephants, profiles on uh, any kind of crazy animal you can think of that isn't native to Japan, tigers, buffalo, I mean, an American thing in there. And one of the segments they did was based on this little creature that exists in Australia. It still is. It's called the frilled lizard. And what the frilled lizard is, it's this little lizard that extends its frills to ward off predators. You laugh, but if we are attacked by a group of feral stuffed owls, I will be prepared. <laughs> this thing became a big phenomenon in Japan. They started making videotapes, books, keychains, the thing I'm wearing on my head right now, dedicated to this little guy. Uh, then they eventually imported them to Japan. And CBS News did a special story on this weird phenomenon of the fact that this lizard was super popular in this country. And that segment was seen by a guy named Vin de Bona. Who's Vin de Bona? He produced MacGyver. Remember MacGyver? Ask your parents. Uh, he saw the segment, thought, I can make that work in America. And he creates this little show called Animal Crackups after having done a lot of detective work to track down the makers of Waku Waku, Animal, at Waku Waku Animal Land, which is owned by Tokyo Broadcasting System, which shall henceforth be known as TBS in order to save on time. Uh, the show airs in ABC, then it moves to syndication, and it is a modest success in terms of television. The next success to come from Japan is probably the biggest success that will come from Japan, which is a show, comes from a show called Kato-chan, Kato Ken-chan, Gokigen TV. And what that show was, was a variety program starring uh, Cha Kato and the late Ken Shimura. And again, it was a variety show. They would have sketches. They would have various games. They would have, uh, they had like a let's make a deal portion, a detective story. And one of the things they had was this segment where they would take a uh, home video that had been sent in by a viewer, uh, usually of them falling, getting hurt, something cute. And they would show it, and then they would talk over it uh, at the end of it. And that format, again, proved very popular with uh, people who wanted who handle international formats and syndication, but because Vin Bona had already worked with Tokyo Broadcasting System on Waku Waku Animal Land, that gave him the uh, first dibs on a little show called America's Funniest Home Videos. America's Funniest Home Videos, premiering on Thanksgiving in 1989, is, as of us making this, the longest running American game show based on a Japanese format. It is also the longest running American game show based on any foreign format. And again, they, they didn't have a whole lot of footage early on, so they actually used some footage from the Japanese version because it still can play in the US. You know, it's weird, but again, I should point out America's funniest home videos, yet we are showing footage from Japan and identifying it as such. So later on, uh, uh, they try again with this little show called Happy Family Plan, uh, which is imported later, the big moment by Vin de Bona. Quick, can anyone in here name the first 100 digits of pi? First 100 digits of pi? Probably not, but if I gave you a week to memorize them, you probably could. No, oh, don't discount yourself. And what Happy Family Plan was, was it was a show wherein a family would be documented for one week with one member of the family trying to master some sort of mundane task, like the aforementioned memorizing 100 digits of pi. Um, sinking six billiard balls and without missing a shot, riding a unicycle through a small course, walking a tightrope, something that a person who specializes in the task could probably do very easily. But your average person, I'm guessing no one in this room knows how to walk a tightrope. I could be wrong. I don't know. Uh, they would give them a week to do it. And then they would have one and only one shot to pull it off on television, on television. And if they succeeded, they would win up to $3 million 
yen worth in prizes, again, you can circumvent it if you give away prizes, for themselves and for their family. If they fail, they have to get on the subway with their family. And they're telling you, no problem, don't worry, it's OK. But you know what they're really thinking. <laughs> Again, another format that proves very popular. They actually made a movie out of it. Think about it, you know, family proving themselves worthy. You can get it on Australian DVD, but it's off the charts expensive because it's a foreign format and a foreign import. Uh, Nabona brings the format to the United States. Uh, as the big moment, starring Brad Sherwood, who would go on to do Whose Line Is It Anyway? And it airs for exactly six episodes and then ends. Yeah, the first, not the first failure for Vin Nabona, but probably the, most, the biggest one. But it's a, it's a risk for ABC, because it aired on ABC. And ABC, as we all know, was one of the big three networks. Anyone here old enough to remember the big three? OK, good, I'm not old. Uh, and ABC, at that point in time, was at the bottom of the three. And when you are at the bottom, you try new things in order to get back to the top such as importing a Japanese game show. Eventually, they will import a British game show that will prove to be much more popular in format. It's called Millionaire. Around the same time, we have the proliferation of cable. Remember cable? Well, I do. Cable was this box that we would put to our TVs that gave us all these channels, most of which we didn't watch. In the 90s, we have cable channels popping up all the time. Uh, and when you are a new cable network, you need programming that fits your theme for 24 hours. And you can do that one of two ways. You either have to Commission new shows, which you're going to have to do that anyway, which costs money, time, union labor, actors, etc. cetera. Uh, or you can get pre-existing footage and show that. So for example, if you are the Food Network, you're going to create a food-related channel. You need to commission some food-related programming. Bless you. You need to buy some previously existing food-related programming to fill your schedule. But there's only time, so many times you can show the frugal gourmet before people get used to it. So what Food Network did was they took a risk, and they imported a, some footage from this Fuji television show called Ryori no Tetsujin, uh, which literally translates to Chef of Iron, Iron Chef. Iron Chef, the first ever competitive cooking show to air in the United States. I don't need to explain a cook competitive cooking show. We all know how, what that is. But this is a big risk because they're actually showing foreign footage on American television. Now, not necessarily foreign footage, but specifically Asian footage, because at the time, and to some extent, there still exists a thought process amongst executives that Americans will not watch Asian television or Asians. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a good thing, but it exists. It's getting better, as evident by the fact that Iron Chef is a success. But there is still this thought that Americans will not watch Asian programming. And they kind of are able to circumvent it by the fact that it's a cooking show. We all eat food. Well, it's a little bit more universal. So prior to this, the only time you were ever going to see Japanese television variety shows was on things like crazy television from around the world, world's weirdest television, those kind of specials that they would do where they would show little snippets of like a little three minute video of Ultra Quiz, just little snippets kind of explaining vaguely what the concept of the show was. And one of the shows you would see a lot in those types of footage, types of shows, was this little thing called Operation Takeshi's Castle, Hun Takeshi Jo, which was a variety game show wherein they would beat Takeshi Kitano, the comedian, the gentleman in the center, uh, would sadistically run over this castle, was the warlord of this castle. And there would be an army of 100 contestants who would be trying to storm the castle by uh, doing these sort of surrealist challenges one at a time. Uh, a huge, a massive pond with polystyrene stones in it. Uh, some of them will sink when you stand on them. Some of them will remain stable when you stand on them, get across the pond without hitting the water. Uh, Three-wire suspension bridge, walk across it whilst holding a ball, whilst they fire cannons at you. They are not real cannons. Do not get your undies in a bunch. Um, and then as the show went on, they started doing more, more, crazy, more crazy kind of things, like having giant rolling pins the contestants had to run over, a giant you know, obstacle course made to look like a Famicom game. Um, what else do we have? We have a surfboard that's on a bar that spins in a circle. And you have to get on the surfboard and jump over some exalty fish and then try to reach a finishing platform. Very, very surreal challenges that ends in some sort of battle to try to storm the castle and win 1 million yen, again, less than 2 million yen, which is about 9,000, 8,000 US dollars, which if someone wants to do the inflation, I think is about 16 grand today. Um, again, visually interesting, visually stimulating, at least I hope, because we're going to fade down. Uh, so visually interesting, and you weren't the only ones that think so. Uh, in 1988, 20th Century Fox Television, hey, another new network, tries a risk. 
creates a pilot called King of the Mountain. They make two of them. And then five years later, our friend Vin de Bona creates a thing called Storm the Castle. Again, a pilot ostensibly um, based on Takeshi's Castle. Now, there's a great deal of changes betwixt the two. Whereas Takeshi's Castle has 100 contestants per episode, uh, these two pilots only have about 10 to 20 contestants per episode. The Japanese version has health and safety, but it is significantly reduced compared to what American health and safety was at the time. There was health and safety. They don't want people getting hurt that bad, trust me. Uh, it's got, they really don't want people getting hurt today. Um, and with Puntakeshi Joe, there was a little bit more loose in terms of who could continue and who couldn't. With our shows, we had a quiz show scandal in the 50s. Uh, so Congress passed law, says you can't rig a show. So now everything is very, very tightly you know, formatted with our game shows. So they have to have a strict set of rules to determine who can move on and who can't. Uh, Takeshi Joe runs from 1986 until 1989, May 2nd, 1986, April 14th, 1989. And they do three more specials after that. Uh, whereas King of the Mountain and Storm of the Castle last exactly one special each. Uh, well, King of the Mountain has two, but only one of them ends up airing. So, again, that's really the last time you're ever going to see Takeshi's Castle, again, outside of the aforementioned crazy television from the world. That is, unless you are a new network called Spike TV, the first network for men, and you need programming to fill your schedule. And there's a group of ragtag producers and writers who come up with this idea of taking another Japanese show, re-editing it, re-dubbing it, completely changing the storyline, putting it in the guise of an American sports commentary show, and then you get this little thing called MXE Most Extreme Elimination Challenge. And thus, the floodgates are now open for Japanese content on American television. For people see this, whereas with Iron Chef, they're just seeing it as a fluke. Now they realize, oh, wait a minute. We can actually make Japanese shows. We can just take this footage and show it. People will watch it. People not scared by this. Um, and so secondary to that, uh, Spike TV, bitter about the fact that they don't own the rights to MXC, commissions buys a show called Spring of Trivia, Trivia no Izumi, Fountain of Trivia. There's various translations. And what Trivia no Izumi was, was it was a show wherein, again, like Waka Waka the Butsuland, you have a celebrity panel of five. They sit behind a podium, and then they are presented with some sort of piece of trivia. Trivia is not necessarily a question asked on a quiz show. It's some piece of information that is useless. I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, and then the celebrity would register their level of surprise by pressing this button, which makes that sound. And as we all know, he is the Japanese equivalent of ha, wa, expression of surprise. I'm going to leave this. Would you mind if I lift this right here? I'm going to present you with some trivia. And I just want to see the level of interest that it is. So if you find the trivia interesting, amusing, surprising, etc., Please press the button. One press per person. Thank you. And I've also, again, there's some hand wipes. There's some sanitizer there. If you want to hit it with the back of your hand, if you have a book or something you want to hit it with, that's perfectly fine. I have five questions for you. Do we all know who this gentleman is? Peter Pan. Yes. If you are shocked by that and pressing the button, then you are easily amused because that is not the trivia. Do we all know the basic story of Peter Pan? You know, Peter Pan goes to the Darling household, takes Wendy to. Never Neverland, the Lost Boys, you know, stay perpetually young. He bites Captain Hook with Tinkerbell, wins the day, et cetera, et cetera, uh, saves the Indian princess. We, we all know the basic story. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Yeah. Question three. By any chance, has anybody in this room read the original 1900 J.M. Barry version of Peter Pan? Good. So you know where I'm going to be going with this, don't you? OK. <laughs> Keep it at that for a minute. Ever wonder how the Lost Boys stay perpetually young? If you know the answer, don't scream it out, because you'll ruin the surprise. Mm -hmm. Question five. Can anyone read that? And I don't mean read it out loud. I mean comprehend what it says. And if you can't, don't worry. I can't either. OK. Well, let me give you the translation. All righty. So again, if you are shocked, surprised, bemused, caught off guard, et cetera, please press the button. In the original 1900 version of Peter Pan, written by J.M. Barry, uh, the reason that the Lost Boys stay perpetually young is because when they turn 18, Peter Pan kills them. I heard gasps. Please press the button. <laughs> now, anyone can get up and claim that. But how do we know it to be true? Well, let's go to J.M. Barry's estate. And I let in some flowery music that was supposed to catch you off guard as well. We can skip that. And let's talk to the man who runs J.M. Barry's estate, which is this man, and see if he knows whether or not that's true. And he does, in fact, confirm for us that, yes, Peter Pan did kill 
the uh, Lost Boys when they turned 18, when they seemed to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter Pan was killing them as vindictively as possible. So the show then asks, well, how is he doing it? How could Peter Pan be killing you know, the Lost Boys? So there's a couple of theories, uh, one of which being that maybe he just stabs them. Um, he killed Captain Hook, you know, maybe he fed them to the crocodile. Um, and then again, he has Tinkerbell on his side, maybe he just uh, drops them from a tall height from their, to their deaths. Yeah, I heard Gasp's expression, if, this weird, if we weren't running short on time, I would ask you to please press the button. Uh, let's say, I don't know. I think I got 20 reactions of surprise. I'll let the group determine that. 20 people maybe found that off-putting. Raise your hand if you were surprised by that. Let's see if we can do it that way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Cool, 20. It means the person who sent that in gets two. Uh, let me do the math in my head. It's two. Uh, no, it's not 200 yen. No, it's 100 yen per thing. So it's 2,000 yen. $19, they have five people, so you can win up to about $80, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. And they would have pieces of trivia, you know, various random things. There's a bug that defecates only once every two years. Uh, there's a guy who won a marathon despite the fact that he stopped halfway through to defecate himself. Um, if you put an eraser in liquid nitrogen, it will explode. Uh, and then there's some stuff that doesn't really translate well and some stuff that would not be surprising to us, that would be surprising to a Japanese audience. George Washington had, had fake teeth. Who doesn't know that? The people who didn't know that? OK, cool. Um, so on a very odd concept, um, one of the other segments of this show was called the seed of trivia. And what the seed of trivia is, is that a viewer would send in a question, and they would test it out to determine the level of humorousness of it. So for example, if you take a Super Bowl, the size of a baseball, and you pitch it at a batter, a professional baseball batter, and he hits it, will it travel further than a regular baseball? And the answer is yes. If you have a group of professional bodyguards play dodgeball against a group of Japanese middle schoolers, will they be able to win for, will they be able to survive for 10 minutes? The answer may surprise you, no. This was, uh, this was 2003. This was right around the time Mythbusters was starting, so it's corollary to Mythbusters. And what's interesting about this show is you guys are going to be learning some trivia. Well, hey, because it's called Spring of Truth, so you're going to learn something new. And you're going to learn something that, for some reason, has never been purported on the internet that I have, have fact-checked and verified. Which, if you go on the English language Wikipedia page for Spring of Trivia, as of us making this, which is October 8th, 2022, you will see this quote. Spike TV had planned to produce an American version of the show premiering in spring of 2005, but that version never materialized, and the network decided against ordering episodes of the English dub, because they had aired a few episodes with the English dub, which was a weird choice. That is not true. They did make an American version of Spring of Trivia, and it did air on Spike TV. Of course, when it aired here, it was not called Fountain of Trivia, because that means nothing in English. It was called Mansers. Aww. Yes, Mansers is the American remake of Spring of Trivia. Of course, because it's called Mansers, they're not going to do trivia about Peter Pan. They're going to do trivia that I feel very uncomfortable giving to you with children in the room. So Thank you. you are very, very welcome. I'm sorry for traumatizing your children with the Peter Pan thing. And you actually, again, this show aired for four seasons, oh, I'll go back a little bit, aired for four seasons, sorry about that. Aired for, I think they made four seasons worth of them on Spike TV. You can actually go on Amazon.com and you can buy episodes and watch them. Do not waste your money, do not waste your brain cells. God only gave you so many, please keep them. We're gonna breeze by this a little bit quickly because I'm doing a panel later on this because we're running short on time, which is uh, we have a show called Kaneka Bonzuke, also made by Tokyo Broadcasting System that has a spinoff, which is called uh, well, actually, it's a format again. That's an obstacle course show. I forgot to put that slide in there. And then it's, it is, has a show that spins off from it called Sasuke. And Sasuke is actually will become to be known as Ninja Warrior. I'm doing a panel on that in uh, about an hour from now in room 124, if I'm remembering the, uh, the uh, pamphlet correctly. Um, so one of the things we see at this time is we have the proliferation of YouTube, which means that Whereas before, the only way to see Japanese television is if you go to conventions specifically designed to distribute and show Japanese television from around the world. 
Well, now that we have YouTube, someone with actual dubbing technology and the ability to take footage and then just show it on, tell, just show it on, on YouTube, they can put it up there and they can put a little label on it that says something to the effect of crazy Japanese game show, human Tetris. Do we all know what this is that I'm referring to? Bingo. Does anybody actually need the footage? Because if we do, we can play it. And if not, we'll just need to skip through. We all get understand the concept, okay? Because we can. Uh, let's fade down just in case. Back up. Um, again, but what brain? But what it is? It's called Brainwall Narcabe. And what it is? It's a segment on a variety show, kind of like Kato Chan Kenshan, uh, that is not a game show in a traditional sense. They have the celebrities doing it for essentially comedic effect. But if you're an American television executive, you don't necessarily know this, and so you. You, you, just, you just see the view count. You just see 28 million views. You just see you know, the thing. Oh, and the, again, out of touch network executives think, hey, let's buy that and let's make that show here. And the Japanese go, OK, cool. We'll sell it to you. And that's when you get this thing called Hole in the Wall, which aired on the Fox network. Uh, it only aired for about 19 episodes. Thank God. Uh, and uh, you know, again, because you're taking a format which is people trying to fit through holes in walls that are coming at you. We all laugh at that for about five minutes. Extend that into a 30 minute long show that airs weekly. Eventually, I can assure you, you will go, OK, I've seen it, and you will move on. It was also produced by Scott St. John, who is famous for producing nothing but garbage. <laughs> I said it, and I don't care who hears it. Uh, Shark Tank. Yep, Shark Tank is based on a foreign format. We all know Shark Tank group of people with ideas pitch an idea to investors, whether the investor wants to buy it or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Shark Tank is based on a foreign format. It's actually based on a show called Dragon's Den, uh, which is a primarily credited to the British format. I actually don't know if this is a screen grab from the British version of Dragon's Den. I assume it is because it says BBC in the upper left-hand corner. But uh, if I'm being perfectly blunt, I've never seen a single second of British Dragon's Den, and I probably never will. But again, the British are credited with creating the format for Shark Tank, when in fact it was actually based on a show called Tiger's Money Mone no Tora, which is essentially the same format. Uh, you know, uh, one person pitching to actually just one investor trying to get them to invest in their product or invest in their idea uh, and format it thusly in order to you know, prove capital to make whatever it is that they want. Uh, but again, being as Americans, being as a Western world, we don't like to give credit to the Japanese, so we credit the British, or we just outright ignore them. For example, we make a 12-minute like a documentary about the Canadian version of Dragon's Den, and we don't even freaking mention that it's based on a Japanese show. Stupid documentary makers. And again, there is this precedence in this world of not giving the Japanese credit for their ideas or just trying to ignore them outright. I'm sure you all have questions. I don't know how many we can get to because I'm only supposed to be here for another 10 minutes before the next person comes in. And I don't want to take their time because I had my time taken. Um, so uh, if anybody has any questions that they think that I can answer very, very quickly about Japanese television, game shows, uh, rigmarole, anything, I don't know how if I'm still registering that on the microphone. Am I still registering the sound? OK, good. Um, any kind of questions like that, now would be the time to ask them. <laughs> That bit cost me forty dollars. <laughs> uh, we have ten minutes. You can go to the next slide. I had a slide prepared. I always forget that I have that. And I have an ending too. You don't need to tie it all together. You, sir. Yes, Ultra Quiz had one. Uh, had, I think it had more than one, and it had a Game Boy game. Uh, I'm trying to remember if other ones had Famicom games. I know Naru Hodo the World, which is a variety show, had a Super Nintendo game. Um, I'm sure there are more that I don't know of. If I can think of anything, uh, I'll put an addendum on the online version and let you know that way. Um, any other questions? And there are actually two versions of there are actually two Takeshi's Castle games released uh, to Famicom. Usually, we only think of the one. Uh, any other questions? Oddities, absurdities. That makes it easy because now I can get to my ending really, really quickly. But before we do that, if you ha do have any questions that you come up with or just don't want to ask publicly, that's fine. Uh, here's my 
email address. I have business cards that I put somewhere that I will put out if you want to take one. Uh, you can email me any questions that you, or maybe you'll remember something later. You get the idea. So to wrap all this up, the Japanese have hundreds upon hundreds of formats. If you go on Tokyo Broadcasting Systems International Sales page and go click on Variety, you'll see all the different formats they have. I didn't even touch on everything that's come to the US because I don't have enough time. Um, again, they have all these ideas that are just ripe for the picking. But we as Americans, again, we have this proclivity to just utilize a brand. So we just remake something, like we just bring Press Your Luck back and just keep remaking it over and over again. Even though it's not really that similar to the original version, again, it's selling a brand. When we need to be selling ideas. We need to be coming up with these things. The Japanese have given us these interesting ideas. We've seen it before. How about an idea where we have a giant obstacle course with a bunch of wind chimes and various other things that make noise? And the trick is you have to get through it in a set period of time without triggering a sound that's more than 50 decibels. I would watch it. I don't know if everyone would, but it's worth a shot. How about we import Tokyo Friend Park, one of the longest running formats in Japan, which is based on an amusement park theme. Everybody's stuck indoors. We all want to see this. We need to bring these shows to the US. In order to have a fighting chance of having any sort of market shares in terms of our game shows, we need new ideas. It's, it's a fact. We can't just keep recycling things over and over. And the Japanese have proven time and time again that you can be as creative as you want. And again, just take an idea, run with it. You can make it work. Thank you for putting up with my crazy. If you have any questions, again, you can email me. Stay safe. Thank you for choosing to come to this panel. I'm sorry it wasn't as uh, succinct as I would have liked it, but I hope, did everybody enjoy it? You don't have to say yes if you didn't. OK, good. All righty, thank you for putting up with it. Stay safe, and remember, it's hard to see the end when you're beginning.